the front line is combat at its most brutal. It drives people to extreme acts for many complex reasons. They were fighting for each other, not for patriotism, but for their buddies. We reveal the most decisive front lines in the Second World War and take you deep into the heart of battle with the men who were there. They were attacking with divisions, and I had one rifle company with about 100 men. I was down to my last box of ammunition. We had no food, and we were hurt. It's May 1944. For five months, the Allies have been hammering the German defenses in southern Italy with little success. Three bitter battles to break their hold have failed. There's no good solution to this problem. There, there are only bad solutions to this problem. And the sad thing is the Allies essentially try all of the bad solutions, one after the other. Thousands of men and machines will now converge on the only road to Rome and the mountain guarding it. There's no good way to capture it. There's no good way to neutralize it. Of all the bitter, attritional combat in the Second World War, this will be among the nastiest. But the story of the road to this final confrontation is a long and bloody one. Places like Monte Cassino, if they're defended, are always going to be horrifically violent and horrifically bloody. By the end of 1943, the Allies have turned the tide of the war in North Africa. All eyes are on the next step, the breaking of the Axis stranglehold in Europe. While plans for D-Day build up, Italy is the new front line. Sicily and Naples have fallen to the Allies. The next prize is Rome. Italy joined the Allies earlier in the year, but it is occupied by the Germans who are determined to defend the Reich on Italian soil. The Allied commanders are facing a formidable adversary, but some of their biggest challenges will come from their own limitations at the highest level. On the German side, Germans have one commander, Kesselring, who is a deeply experienced, wily old fox of a general who was never better than when he was given some kind of hopeless defensive cause and proved it in no better place than Italy. On the other side, you have not one commander, you have a whole coalition of commanders from a range of different allied countries, from imperial powers, from colonies, from the United States, from all different places. And not only couldn't they agree with each other, not only did they not like each other, they often didn't even understand each other. This kind of thing is a recipe for disaster. A unified command on one hand against a fractious rabble mob of, of disagreeing general officers on the other side. As well as trying to keep a coordinated command, the Italian campaign will involve negotiating some of the hardest terrain in the whole of the Second World War and will confront the Allies with challenges for which they are hopelessly unprepared. The idea is that the Allies are going to capture Rome by that Christmas. They're going to be eating spaghetti in the Italian capital within about three months. And they forget Italian geography, which is the masses of mountains and rivers, uh, and that's going to slow down the advance of even the most mechanised army in the world. There are very few good hard roads in Italy, so most are earth, just designed for horses and carts, they all get washed away every autumn and get rebuilt every summer. So the rains of autumn impede even the most advanced armies, and that's then followed by snow. It was three months in the line. It was bitterly, bitterly cold. It was the coldest winter they've had in Italy, and we weren't really properly dressed for it, so it was really tough going. But the challenges don't end there. The Allies know that the Germans are waiting for them. 
but not the extent of their defenses, because the Germans have made the Italian countryside a carefully constructed death trap. They established a number of defensive lines. And uh, during the Battle of Monte Cassino, we're looking at a position which the Germans called the Winterstellung, so the winter position, which consisted of uh, basically three lines, the most important one, and in this case, the most famous one, being the Gustav line, which the Germans had prepared particularly well. The Germans have prepared the territory to channel the attackers while picking them off from positions on the many hilltops. The number of roads is very limited. Mining some of the roads, so you can channel the path that the enemy will have to take. And no geographical feature is ignored as an asset to impede an attack. You could flood areas to prevent enemies from advancing into certain area that you wanted to protect. You could dam a river, and you could then blow a dam when the enemy attack. As impediments to an attacking force, Italy's rivers are hard to beat. Not only are they fast, freezing, and deep, they turn a floundering assault into an easy target. Wherever possible, you would establish defensive positions on the high ground behind the river, which gives you a direct line of sight of the enemy. In the coldest winter for a generation, the Allied invasion slows to a stalemate. We blindly wander into rivers that flood their banks, roads that are washed away, and then we're freezing our butts off in the uh, Italian theater, going absolutely nowhere. By January 1944, we have got as far as a place called Monte Cassino. Situated over 140 kilometers southeast of Rome, the town of Cassino lies between two mountain ranges. The landscape above the town has been turned into a fortress by the German army. The Allies' first objective will be taking the towns and villages at the foot of Monte Cassino and their first hurdles, the fast-flowing rivers in the way. Just short of the town of San Angelo runs the Rapido River, and facing it, the battle-weary troops of the Texas 36th Division. They're already hardened by an epic fight on the road from Naples. Their orders now to take San Angelo. Before that, they have to cross the river. Now, they're commanded by Major General Fred Walker. And Fred Walker's a very interesting guy because he was a, an instructor at various American military schools before the war. And one of his students is now his commander, who is General Mark Clark in charge of the 5th American Army, which is operating in Italy. And Clark and Walker don't really see eye to eye. Walker can see all sorts of problems of being bounced into doing a river crossing very quickly for which his men have had no preparation and time to prepare. And Clark wants Walker to just get on with it. Your job is to get across the river, don't care how you do that. Uh, and although Walker runs all his plans past uh, the army commander, um, really he's left on his own. Fred Walker must carry out his order despite believing it's a suicide mission. I'll swear I do not see how we or any other division can possibly succeed in crossing the Rapido River when that stream is included within the main line of resistance of the strongest German position. If Walker complains, Walker's already quite an old man, he's the other side of 50, he'll be straight on a plane back to the United States and out of the war. So he's just going to do what he's told. And of course, what he's told in the circumstances and the time he's got uh, to mount a river crossing don't add up to a sort of viable military plan. Walker and his officers are painfully aware that a river crossing is one of the most dangerous types of assault that infantry can face. The 
biggest issue that you've got is that you don't know what's on the other bank. You know, what their minds are like, what the defences are like, what have they got prepared for you. You just know that they've got an awful lot prepared for you. The chances are that you're going to drown almost as much as you'll get shot or, or blown up. Just as you go across a field in an attack, when you go across a river, what you want is cover. So you want cover from fire from artillery, from tanks, from machine guns and so on. A fast flowing river in particular will take you away from that cover very dramatically. You could be landing miles downstream and you are festooned in kit. You are carrying almost your own body weight and if you go into that water, the chances of you popping up at the end are slim indeed. If the attacking soldier is lucky enough to survive and get to the opposite bank, the ordeal is just beginning. There's the sense of never-ending threat. You get across the river, not done. Get across his first defences, not done. Then you've got to find the enemy positions. By the time you get to the enemy positions, not done, because they're firing it from the second enemy defensive positions. The Texans face a terrifying opponent. In the area of Casino, that the Americans are going to assault are Panzer Grenadiers, mountain troops and Fallschirmjäger, who are German paratroops. And in the particular vicinity, it's the 15th Panzer Grenadier Division. Now, they've already fought in Sicily. They're used to the Italian theatre, and they're lavishly equipped with machine guns. Patient and experienced, the Panzer Grenadiers are ready for the Texans' every move. Because they know the ground, they've been there for a long time before the Allies have arrived, they've been able to pace out their ranges. They've sown the American side of the riverbank with anti-personnel mines. There's barbed wire everywhere. And essentially, they've put together a real dragon's den of local defences. And onto that layer very experienced troops. We are undertaking the impossible but I shall keep that to myself. However, my staff and regimental and battalion commanders are no fools. Fred Walker's private diary reveals his horrible recipe for disaster because if the, the guy at the top doesn't believe in the plan, then it's not going to work. And that's exactly what happens. Fred Walker, experienced general, seen service as many men of his rank have done in the First World War with the American Expeditionary Force. And as part of his service, he'd led a unit of doughboys on the River Marne, where they had been in the defender's shoes. So they had had a German uh, river assault coming towards them. And without taking hardly any casualties, they knocked the Germans back and caused dreadful, dreadful casualties among the assaulting troops. And of course, his concern and, and fear, and, and understandably so, was that the Germans were going to have their turn um, at, at his boys this time round. 36th Texan Division is a National Guard division, so they all know each other. They've all trained in the interwar period, and they're mates. And that means going into combat and taking casualties is so much worse, um, because these are men who've had friendships going back to school, to college. On the night of the 20th of January, the 141st and 143rd regiments of the 36th Division set out in pitch darkness to cross the Rapido. From the beginning, the plan starts to falter. That night, weather's bad, everywhere is muddy. So the infantry take an awful lot longer to, to march up to the river line. Assault boats have to be dragged through muddy fields and over barbed wire, and the barbed wire starts to pierce the rubber dinghies. So by the time they get to the waterline, they've got fewer boats than they realize. And now they start tripping over anti-personnel mines. That alerts the Germans. So when the dinghies go into the water, the fast-flowing rapido lives up to its name, and a lot of the boats are simply swept away, flip over, drown the occupants, or are washed down the river. The flares go up, the Germans can see what's going on. So these guys walk into a complete maelstrom. We were about three feet deep into our foxhole when the Germans spotted us. Then all hell broke loose. 
Mortars, artillery fire, and machine gun fire about six to eight inches above ground hit us. But they've got their orders to work too, so they're trying to send guys across. And by the time first light happens, there are very few people across the river. The Germans are completely wise to what's going on. Both American regiments have taken heavy casualties, and they can't do anything by day. But what they are trying to do is assemble a bridge. And the moment it's complete, the next morning, the Germans can see it and they blow it up. There were bodies everywhere, mostly parts, arms, legs, some decapitated. I thought I was going to get sick, but I guess I didn't have time. And there was always that spine-chilling cry for medic. But there weren't any left. Throughout the following day, the few American soldiers on the German bank of the Rapido can only cower in shallow foxholes, knowing the tiniest movement means instant death. Trouble is, you're in a valley surrounded by mountains, and on top of every mountain is a German observer with a pair of binoculars directing the fire of numerous pieces of German artillery. And these guys really haven't got a hope. All the troops that have made it across to the far bank are slowly surrounded and either taken prisoner uh, or killed or wounded. Very few people make it back. Of the 4,000 men who made the attack, fewer than half return. The rest are killed, captured, wounded, or missing in action. The Germans have lost just a few hundred men. It will take another three days of bitter fighting before the Rapido can be crossed further upstream. But with a bridgehead on the bank, the attacking US 34th Infantry Division's problems have just begun. They must now ascend a 500-meter mountain with a battle at the top. And then an objective that will become by far the most difficult of the campaign. When you go to the Monte Cassino area, you are struck by this thumping great lump of razor-edged hill. And sitting on top of it is this vast abbey building that has been there for centuries. And its walls are so thick that it looks like a fortress, lying squat right on the top of the hill with superb observation in every single direction. The military value of the monastery is impossible to ignore. Even though it's a religious building, even though it was inhabited by exclusively monks at the time, you can't help thinking, well, if I was the defending army, I would certainly have some troops up there, if only a bunch of observers. The Allies are convinced the Germans are breaking an agreement not to militarize the historic site and are using the monastery as an observation post to shell Allied infantry. It has to be taken out of enemy control. The problem is, it is virtually unassailable. There's no good way to capture it. There's no good way to neutralize it. It is an unbelievably good defensive position. That's why it was put there in the first place. It's occupying a really prime defensive spot, and they built the building there deliberately because of that. At the beginning of February, regiments of the US 34th Infantry Division, the Red Bulls, and the 36 Texans start the assault up the rocky hillside. Their fighting will be described as one of the finest feats of arms carried out by any soldiers during the war. Monte Cassino is overlooked by several outcrops of rock which are slightly higher, and on each one the Germans have sighted mortar and machine gun positions. They all have overlapping and interlocking arcs of fire, which means you can't get near any of them. Not only that, in the ground and the approaches to them are lots of mines and booby traps. So none of this is get-attable. 
because the Germans have had so much time to sort of build in the perfect defensive system. Even before the Americans can get to the Monastery Hill, they have to fight across gullies and ravines packed with mines and booby traps. On February the 7th, Clark orders a final assault on the mountain. Within just a few days, the Americans suffer over 2,000 casualties and have to withdraw. It's time for another nation of Allied soldiers to take up the fight, and the Americans are relieved by the New Zealand 2nd Division. Commanding them is General Sir Bernard Freyberg. Bernard Freyberg, extremely experienced New Zealand commander, had fought with distinction uh, in the First World War and uh, been decorated for gallantry on, on many occasions. He'd been experienced in the Second War, um, had fought in Crete and, and North Africa. Uh, so, of course, by the time he got to the Italian campaign, um, he was very much seen as one of the favourites, particularly of Churchill. You know, Churchill called him his salamander, um, as he you know, likened him to the lizard that would survive through fire. Freyberg is tasked with finding a better way to take the monastery and stop it being used by the Germans. He decides there is only one solution. Before attacking it with infantry, it must be bombed. But there's a problem. It's a world-famous architectural treasure. It was founded in the 6th century AD and was the main seat of the Benedictine order for many centuries. So an extremely important part of the cultural history, not only of Italy, but also of Christianity. The Allies badly need evidence that the Germans are using it or face international condemnation for destroying a world heritage site. They are hugely relieved when intelligence confirms their suspicions. We were listening in to German transmissions that were being made in code and the signals were being deciphered. A signal was interpreted between the German commander and one of his subordinates. And essentially the message read, is the abbot in the monastery? But Abbot was abbreviated, as everything in, in military messages was, to ABT, perfectly logical abbreviation for Abbot. But it's also the abbreviation for Abteilung, which is a German battalion-sized organisation of perhaps 500 military personnel. It all adds up, except the Germans aren't using the monastery. The reason won't emerge until much later. The German corps commander defending the area was a guy called Friedo von Sanger und Etelin. Uh, and General von Sanger und Etelin was a lay member of the Benedictine order and the mother church, the founding establishment of the Benedictine order is the Abbey at Monte Cassino. So he's a good Bavarian Christian aristocrat. He's not a Nazi. He's now defending this abbey, which is the foundation of everything he believes in. So he's not going to let any military unit inside the abbey grounds in contravention of his faith and his beliefs. So we are pretty sure today there was no German troops in the abbey before the battle started. In the end, the grim logic of military necessity decides the monastery's fate. The challenge for the Allied commanders in Monte Cassino being a monastery and being of vast religious and symbolic importance is that if you try to avoid damaging the monastery by bombing it or shelling it, what you're then telling the infantry you send to attack it is that you value that religious and symbolic worth more than you value their lives. And that's a hard message for an infantry soldier to hear. That's a message they don't want to know. They don't care necessarily about the religious symbolism as much as they care about their own lives. And what they don't want to hear from their commanding officers is that they're not doing everything they can to help those infantry capture what is, after all, a mountain and a monastery at top of the mountain. So in some ways, the, the generals were stuck. They could either leave Monte Cassino untouched um, and risk their own soldiers essentially refusing to attack, 
or they could support their soldiers to the utmost and destroy a valuable site of heritage. The order to bomb the monastery goes out, but this is just the start of Freyberg's problems. His infantry have closed around the area, ready to rush the Germans after the bombing. They need to pull back to safety just before the air raid, but it doesn't go according to plan. For reasons best known to themselves, the Air Force decide to attack a day early because the weather is fine, but they don't tell anyone on the ground. So all the Allied troops are there preparing for the attack on the morrow, when suddenly they see huge, vast air fleets, silver glinting in the sun. First thing that happens is all the forward troops haven't been withdrawn, there's no air attack expected, they're bombed. Worse still, the monastery is full of monks and civilians sheltering from the conflict. They've been warned to evacuate, but are not expecting the attack to come a day early. The abbot is about to negotiate a truce so he can lead the townsfolk and the monks to shelter through the lines. But the air attack goes in, and so even that doesn't happen. The abbey is then drenched with endless thousands of tons of high explosive. Far from eliminating the monastery as a threat, the demolition has killed many innocent people, handed the Germans a propaganda victory, and the ruins create a perfect defensive position for the enemy. The monastery is destroyed, but some of the ruins are still left standing. And now German Fallschirmjäger established defensive positions. And because of its position overlooking the town of Monte Cassino, it now becomes one of the, uh, the main strong points of the German defense. Of all the units in the German armed forces, few are more suited to defending the ruins than the Fallschirmjäger, who are now in their element. Facing both the New Zealanders and the Brits at Monte Cassino were the German Fallschirmjäger, paratroopers, highly motivated, all volunteer, extremely well trained. A lot of them were armed with this, the MP40 submachine gun. 32 round magazine, 9mm. This weapon isn't designed to fire accurate single shots, it's designed to spray the battlefield. The British are walking into a death trap. One young British soldier who had been fighting in the Italian campaign since landing at Salerno in 1943 was paratrooper Albert Darlington. Monastery at the top of Monte Cassino was a bit hairy. You can see a rabbit half a mile away. So a soldier bobbing about is going to get popped. There's no chance. And everybody got their head down. It was a very difficult spot. There was a, a platoon of us, and we were the second lieutenant. And this bloody second lieutenant, I think he's looking for a medal or something. He said, look, he said, lads, there's only one of them over there, and if we rush him, he won't be able to get all of us with the bloody clever stuff this is, you know. When he said, let's go, I believe in this. You've got to be fast and furious, you know. And I was out like lightning, and I was ahead of everybody. And I thought, bloody hell, I'd, I'd overdone it, see. And then I saw the German, who we're all after. He swung the gun round at me, and as he did that, I dived to get my head down. But I couldn't get my legs out the way, and he caught me down the left leg. My mate rushed forward, and while the German was still preoccupied, he got him with a bayonet. I'm, I've been shot and I'm bleeding like hell. And this lieutenant who said, let's rush him, he can't get all of us. When he come over, the bloody German's dead. And he looked at me and said, oh, you'll be all right, Darlington. The stretchers will be along soon. And off they went. I must have lost consciousness a short spell. And when the stretcher boys came for me, the stretcher boys came along 
and they'd got a German on the stretcher that was taken somewhere. And they looked across at me and they said, oh, bloody, I'll look at him, and they chucked the German off, and that was it. With the monastery ruined, Freyberg is keen to attempt a new attack route up the mountain with a substantial force of troops. He thinks a frontal assault on the steepest and shortest face is best. It will be a horrendous miscalculation. The 4th Indian Division and the Gurkhas now make a continuous assault through the night on a mountainside that has been converted into a vertical killing ground. All the usual approaches that you might have gone up are either destroyed or damaged and certainly dominated by German fire. So the only option is literally to climb almost sheer rock cliff faces. Adding to the infantry problems are orders from commanders looking at maps far away. What look like short spaces on paper turn out in reality to be ravines, boulder-covered scree, or simply cliffs. Supply lines are vertical, with every grenade and mortar needing to be hoisted up rock faces. The whole of our front line was overlooked by the enemy-held heights on three sides and in the presence of over 100 unburied and unreachable corpses, it was the one place we wanted to get away from. The battle is a failure, and over 600 Allied soldiers from the Gurkhas, the Indian and British armies are killed or captured. Many are left to die, their bodies unable to be retrieved from the ledges and crevices where they fell. Freyberg now turns to the town of Casino, 500 metres below the monastery, at the foot of the mountain. He hopes he can break through the German lines and open the road to Rome. But Freyberg's battles at Monte Cassino are a small part of a much bigger plan, beyond the Liri Valley and even the whole Italian theatre. Well, by the spring of 1944, the Allied focus was on preparations for the D-Day landings. Overlord, landing in occupied France and, and taking the war to the Germans. Italy then was becoming a bit of a sideshow. Clark and Alexander were very much committed to use the army in Italy to tie down as many German troops as he possibly could and to keep them away from the uh, potential new front up in Normandy. And so Clark and Alexander let Freyberg continue to batter away um, at Monte Cassino for literally little more gain than tying down German troops uh, so that they couldn't move back up north to France. The combat-weary Allied soldiers have little time to rest before the third battle of Monte Cassino gets the go-ahead. It begins exactly a month later on the 15th of March. And in the Allied mind, we have to prepare the battlefield and suppress the Germans, and we're going to do exactly the same thing all over again. Once again, Freyberg orders in the bombers before his troops attack. And once again, the bombers make a horrendous miscalculation. The only proviso here is that the Allied bombers don't come early, but they bomb the wrong valley. Because at 10,000 feet, all the valleys look the same to the Air Force. The error leads to friendly fire hitting the headquarters of the US 5th Army Commander General Mark Clark and a catastrophic mistake in a neighbouring valley. The Free French Forces fighting with us lose a field hospital which is attacked in error. So the number of friendly fire casualties created in these two bombings is staggering and staggeringly unnecessary. Nearly 500 planes drop a 1,000 tonnes of bombs on Casino Town, and it is completely devastated. But the destruction creates problems as well as advantages for the attacking troops. If we picture Casino Town as quite a small, very old settlement at the foot of Casino Hill, composed entirely of very thick old stone buildings, these have been rearranged in the air attacks. There's not a single building that's left standing. So 
casino is completely unrecognisable. That provides huge problems for the attacking troops, who don't know where they're going. It was just murderous bombing. All that was left was great clouds of dust and flames rising up into the air. The word came out, we were going in to mop up any remains. As we advanced, jerrys popped up from every rock and brick, some crawling out of holes in the rubble, still firing their guns. The bombing had shook them up, and they were not organised. However, they could certainly put up a scrap. The defenders of Casino Town are the elite paratroops of the Fulshamjäger. Of 300, 140 have survived the bombing in deep cellars. They emerge furiously determined to avenge their comrades. Paratroopers are always better equipped with automatic weapons because they're expected to fight alone and surrounded deep in enemy territory. And that's where they find themselves. The town has been rearranged into lots of wonderfully little defensive positions that they can man with their machine guns and play to their own advantages and their training. Freyberg orders the 2nd New Zealand Division into battle. They've seen hard service throughout the North African campaign, but nothing prepares them for Casino Town. After the bombing of Casino Town that reduced it to rubble, the Allies then starting to move forward into what was a, a, a moonscape, almost, uh, of destroyed buildings, you know, wrecked roads and so on. They were totally unsuited for that sort of fighting. They went in with Sherman tanks, which just simply couldn't manoeuvre through what the battlefield had been turned into by high explosive and shrapnel. And that meant that when the fighting got underway, it was hand-to-hand, -hand, close quarters uh, between Allied soldiers and experienced veteran German paratroopers. Uh, and that was always a battle that was going to turn bloody at the first instance. One of the men attached to the New Zealanders was a young British para, James Knox. He'd already seen plenty of action, but Casino was something else. I can't remember a building that wasn't virtually destroyed. The whole of Casino town was obliterated. It was just a complete mass of ruins. He was shrugging over rubble all the time. In Casino, you'd be constantly mortared and shelled. If you stood up, you got shot. There's no question about that. You couldn't move because you was under complete observation. The Germans were always slightly higher than us, so they were looking down on us all the time. They were already in the good positions. The more it was bombed, the stronger it made the fortifications, which made it very difficult for us. So most of our movement was at night or when they put down the dense smoke bombs. Such cover might seem to give an opportunity, but for Jim and his comrades, it was only to perform the gruesome tasks of the battlefield. The idea was uh, to try and get to the Germans, which is virtually impossible, but we tried to recover any injured people, which we managed to do quite well. But there are so many dead soldiers. When you get to them, the site wasn't very good at all. I've always had the horrible fear of seeing these bits of bodies. They had a weapon that used to fire six shells and come over like an umbrella, so the spread was enormous. So all you had to do was make sure you was below the ground level. The fighting was incredibly fierce. One of the worst weapons that the Falchum Jäger, the New Zealanders and the Brits were faced with was the mortar. Both sides used them, but mortars were particularly feared by the infantry. And here is a mortar. Why was it so feared? Mainly because you couldn't hear them coming. The rounds had come directly down from the sky and caused havoc. This is a British two-inch mortar. Simple design, no sight. Aiming and accuracy is done by the hand, eye and experience of the bomber. Bomb is placed above, drop down the tube, seats itself in the bottom. Firing mechanism, that would be pulled, initiates the firing pin, hits the base of the mortar round, bomb gone. Range of four to 500 metres. 
Mortar round hits, anything within 20, 25 metres is killed or severely maimed. The force of the blast would turn all of these bricks and rubble into ready-made shrapnel, which would scythe out, cutting through flesh, bone, sinew, you name it. Human beings would simply be shredded. When the mortar went off, it just uh, left a hell of a mess. I mean, it was horrible, because there's nothing worse than an explosion against a man. If you get shot, it's usually a clean wound. But with a, an explosion, a bomb, they're splattered everywhere. The remaining German paratroops concentrate in the Continental Hotel, which now becomes one of the Allies' central objectives. Well, the Germans were about 50 metres away from us in a Continental Hotel. We could shout out to each other. Two days after the bombing, the heavens open with another aerial bombardment, this time rain. Water fills craters, drowns survivors trapped under the rubble and makes movement of supplies even more difficult. You couldn't get any vehicles. There's no, no motorisation into Casino at that particular time. Uh, the only way you could get anything in was by mules. As the fighting continues into spring, the warm weather brings a new misery to the battlefield. The worst thing about Casino was the smell. The stench was absolutely horrible because every time a mortar bomb went off, it raised the stench. And the stench was caused to a, uh, well, no toilets. Uh, there's masses of bodies hanging around because although they used to go out of a night to re retrieve the wounded, most of them were in pieces, you couldn't do it. It was a horrendous, absolutely horrendous. Casino Town becomes a feast for rats and other kinds of vermin. There are clouds of flies wherever you go. There is a horrible stench, uh, not just within the town, but for miles around. You knew you were getting close to Monte Cassino because you could smell it. On the 21st of March, Generals Clark and Alexander give Freyberg 24 hours to break the enemy grip on the town. Two more attacks on the strong point of the Continental Hotel achieve nothing. The next day, the battle is called off and units withdrawn. By the time Freyberg launched his last attack on the Casino Massif, Clark and Alexander had, had decided uh, they were going to shift uh, the entire focus of the, of the attack. As their faith in Freyberg diminishes, Clark and Alexander have been putting together a plan that will assault the German defense of Monte Cassino with a massive force. But the key to breaking the Gustav line remains the problem of the monastery. Despite the weakening German positions, it will still need a sizable army composed of extremely motivated men. They'll need to break a defensive position that has defeated some of the toughest fighters in the world. There are around about 21 different coalition partners fighting on the Allied side in the Italian theater during World War II. But the ones who really stand out are the Free Poles. And this is the second Polish Corps. The Poles are led by a tough, determined, and highly motivated commander, Vladislav Anders. He's the perfect Allied general to take on the German redoubt at Monte Cassino. General Sir Harold Alexander, commanding all the Allied forces in Italy, turns to General Anders and says, would you be prepared to take on the task of attacking the Abbey? And it's a hard question, because the Poles are desperate to attack the Germans to avenge what's happened to their homeland. But Anders knows there's only one Anders army. There are no more reinforcements. There are no spare troops to replenish the ranks if the Anders army take heavy casualties, which they almost certainly will. 
So if you say, yes, we'll go into battle to kill the hated Germans, you run the risk of being completely annihilated. The Poles have a visceral hatred for the Germans. Since its occupation in 1939, Poland has been subjected to a systematic extermination of its people by the Nazis, who regard them as racially inferior. By the end of the war, millions of Poles will have been put to death by the German army. Well, it takes Anders about five minutes to understand that, really, it's a no-brainer. You've got to, for the sake of national pride, take advantage of this uh, opportunity to re-establish yourself as a proud nation. So Anders says, yes, when the next battle comes, we will take on the task of avenging everything that has happened to the Poles and strike a blow for freedom, and we will attack the hilltop uh, at Monte Cassino. Anders knows his men are fiercely motivated, but it will take more than grim determination if they are to triumph over the Germans. They need strength of numbers. The Allies realise that they have thrown too few troops at the German defenders, whereas in the first Battle of Monte Cassino, which is fought over such a wide range uh, of areas, uh, a division might have been employed to attack the Germans. In the forthcoming battle, it's two divisions or a corps. So the numbers are doubled at the very least. Anders also knows that after four months of fighting, the Germans are starting to be worn down. All the way through the first, second and third battles, the Germans have been taking casualties, but they haven't been able to replace them. So they're short of personnel, but they're also short of equipment and ammunition. So Anders recognises that actually this is where numbers will tell. On the 11th of May 1944, 1,600 artillery pieces announced the beginning of Operation Diadem, the fourth and final battle of Monte Cassino, and the Allied drive to Rome. On the mountain, the Poles attempt to take out the German defensive positions called Sangers one by one. But it is a tactic the enemy are prepared for. Defensive rings of Sangers with machine guns that the German paratroops have put up on the hilltop, they all have overlapping and interlocking arcs of fire. So you can't take one position because it's covered by all, all of the others. And that just proves too impregnable to begin with. And in the end, Anders realises that the only way out is to attack them all at once. Anders commits all his reserves to one massive assault, backed up by tanks. Wave after wave of Polish infantry overwhelm the German positions, but at a terrible cost. Poles bring up a lot of tanks for the fourth battle, and it's that weight of artillery, of tanks, of all the German positions being assaulted at once, regardless of casualties. Um, that eventually chips away uh, at the German positions and eventually they begin to fall one by one. Polish dead and wounded after the four-day battle number over 4,000. With advances by the Allies in the valley below, the German commander Kesselring orders a withdrawal from the monastery and the mountain. By the 18th of May, the Germans had abandoned the ruins of the monastery and pulled back. The battlefield, to all intents and purposes, went quiet. Um, the Poles realised this and they sent a patrol up that took up a, a homemade pennant from their unit and managed to raise that, followed by a Union Jack, above the wreckage of the monastery. The only Germans left were the dead and a group of about 30 to 40 wounded who their comrades had left behind to be looked after uh, by the Allied medics, and that really was the, the end of what had been an absolutely dreadful battle. After six months of fighting, the battles of Monte Cassino led to the deaths of almost 80,000 men. With the successful breaking of the Gustav Line, the campaign will grind on up the Italian peninsula for another 12 bloody months, 
ending in the last weeks of the war in 1945.